Before we start, I have a I brought I brought a prop. I brought a prop. She loves me. She loves me not. <laughs> she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. <laughs> she loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. I'm not gonna do that one. <laughs> have you ever done this? Yeah. Okay, I'm sure you have. Hoping that the last petal, right, the last petal reveals that the love is not one way, but a mutual one, okay? Today, we see in our letter, love not, love not. This is actually a good love not. This is one that we do not want the love to be mutual, unlike the love that you so hope from that person, right? that person that you really like, that person that you really love, or from your family or friends. What's also interesting about our passage today is that the word love comes out 51 times, 51 times. But today is the only one where it is used with a negative, negative one, a negative command, a negative encouragement to not love title of our message it is what is not to love what is not to love can you turn with me to first john chapter 2 15 to 17 first john chapter 2 15 to 17 let's all stand and read the word of god together it's only three verses so yeah let's read it out loud together do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord and all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Your word teaches us the truth. And your word wants to teach us about the world today. What is not to love? What is to love not? Would you speak to us? Would you convict us? Would you challenge us, encourage us, and help us to know what to not love in this world? so that we may see your truth and live your truth and obey the truth. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. What is not to love? Should you love your spouse? Yes. Should you love your children? Yes. Yes. Should you love Pastor Chan? Yes. I didn't hear yes. <laughs> Mostly yes. <laughs> Sometimes yes. <laughs> okay. What is not to love? What is the love that God demands us not do? Huh. What is the love that God really hates? Huh. God loves. God is love. But there is love that God hates. What is that? Loving the world. What are we to not love? We are to not love the world. Let's start with the first verse of the day, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. God gives us a clear command here. It's very simple, very straightforward. Do not love the world. We have to understand the word right here. What the world means here, right? What is this world? According to the context, if we're to understand clearly. What is this world that John is talking about here? Is something wrong with the world? Isn't God the one that created the world? In Genesis chapter 1, 31, God called this world that he created very good. John would not ask his readers to hate something that our God in heaven has created. Then could John have challenged his believers to hate people in the world 
Is John writing that? Yet that would be impossible because God really does love the world. For he actually sent his one and only son Jesus to forgive their sins. Then what is this world and its things that we must not love? If it is not going to school in the world or going to work in the world, if it is not hating cars, phones, technologies, sports of the world, if it is not hating science and law of gravity, what is it? This world is talking about the work of Satan and the people that are completely ruled by it. Satan and such people are against God and desire to live without God's control. This world is the invisible, spiritual evil system. So this world is not the general world that God created. When you go outside, you see the beautiful tree, these plants. It is also not the general people living in this world. Okay, you don't go outside and you start looking at people and like, oh, I hate you, I hate you, <laughs> I hate that person, I hate my boss, I hate my manager. No. But it's the evil, demonic, wicked, corrupt system and ideology that God wants us to hate. Apostle Paul reiterated this issue in his letter to the church. As such world is completely against the kingdom of God. There is a spiritual warfare happening. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 5. Can we read it together? For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Arguments and every lofty opinion. Here means ideologies, belief systems, world religions, philosophies, political ideas, or any, any unbiblical worldviews. There are anything and everything that is against the true knowledge of God. So what are we called to do as believers? We're to fight and destroy such lies of the world with the truth of Christ. So Paul is explaining world as things that are opposite of God. John is echoing that definition in our passage. When a Christian is born, he or she is no longer a slave to this evil world system. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the dom domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We believers have been delivered from kingdom of the world to the kingdom of God. They're absolutely opposite of each other. They cannot peacefully coexist together. Hence, if you're a true Christian, if you really believe that you're a true Christian, you will not be able to live peacefully in this world. If you're a true Christian that Paul and John are describing, you cannot habitually love this world, nor will this world love you back. So if you're not loved by the world, it's not a bad news at all. It's actually a good sign that you're doing something right as a Christian. What we see in the world today is absolutely ridiculous. Just turn on the news for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The cultural agendas are completely against the things of God. They attack the Bible, they attack Christianity in every way possible. Traditional family is attacked. Sexual revolution is wild as you can see it. Everywhere you turn, homosexuality is praised and given a whole month to celebrate as a culture. Did you know that? June. Violence is accepted as a means of necessary to carry out one's agenda. Violence is accepted. If you need to carry out an agenda, yes, violence is okay to do. 
Stealing is okay to do. Theft is okay to do. Robbery is okay to do. If you're hungry, yeah, you need to do it. You don't need to go to jail for it. Then why do we need police and army? If that is okay in the world. Materialism is the best thing for people today. Media is used constantly to achieve all these unbiblical values. Honesty and integrity, when was the last time you heard that word? Honesty and integrity. Today, maybe, in the church, you will not hear honesty and integrity in the media, in the news, maybe even at your work. It's hard to find in a man or woman. You find a man or woman that is honest and has integrity, and that is a, that is a man or woman. You know, business will cheat to get their way. This is the world that we're living in. This is the world we're not to love. John gives three reasons why we as believers cannot love this world that we see so plainly today. First, first reason, if you're taking notes, because of who we Christians are. Because of who we Christians are. Look at verse 15. Can we read it together? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. As we have been learning, if we are a true believer, we have been forgiven. We have a true knowledge of God. We have God's word in us. We are in the light and we're walking in the light. Our love for God and Christ goes deeper and stronger each day and every day, every second, every moment, every minute. We're going deeper into God's word and in Christ. So we cannot love the world. If anyone loves the world that we have been describing, that I've been talking about, maybe you've been thinking, yeah, maybe that's not too bad, Pastor Chan. If anyone loves the world that we have been describing, we can confidently say that the love of the Father is not in him. This does not mean that we as Christians are invulnerable against the appeals from the world. I'll be the first one to tell you that I get tempted too. Though we are saints, we are sinners. Who sinned today? Who sinned yesterday? Who sinned this week? All of you should be raising your hand. Though we are saved, we're fallen. By grace, by faith, through Christ, we live as true followers. Yet tempted through our flesh. This temptation can come to us in so many ways. Priority of the world. Amusement from the world. Riches of the world. Lust of the world. We're doing all that we can in this world to fight against these temptations. Aren't we? We do not love it. We're to actually hate it. Luke chapter 16, 13. Can we read it together? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As a believer, we only have one master. We hate one and we love the other. Think of it this way. Can you have two wife? You could love her and love her too, no? <laughs> Wrong. You have to love her and you have to hate her. You can only have one master. We hate one and we love the other. And our God is more important than our spouse. Our God is more important than our children. Our God is more important than our family. Our God is more important than our things. Our God is more important than our school, than our work, than our friends. Our God is more important than our reputation. Our God is more important than the chair that you're sitting on. Our God is more important than the car that you came in. Our God is more important than your bank account. Our God is more important than your house. Our God is more important than everything that you touch, everything that you have seen, everything that you have felt. Our God is way more important. So my question to you is, is it God or the world? 
Second reason why believers cannot love the world when we need to know what the world has actually done in this world. We need to know what the world has actually done in this world. Look at verse 16. Second reason we cannot love the world, we have to see what the world has done to this world. Look at verse 16. Let's read it together. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. From all that is in the world. What is the best? What is the best thing that the world can offer us? Believers or non-believers? Christians or non-Christians? Churchgoers or non-churchgoers? You know what's the best that the world can offer you today? Three-letter word. Sin. Sin. Sin is the dominant force that is controlling this world. Where God is, all that is righteous, holy, and just, and perfect, sin is all that is unrighteous, filthy, unjust, and imperfect. This sin is so powerful that it can, I guarantee you, this sin is so powerful if you have unconfessed sins in your life, if you have sins that you are harboring in your life as if it's your pet carrying it around for past 10 years, guarantee you, sin can destroy your family, can destroy your community, can destroy your culture, can destroy your nation. We have seen that constantly throughout the Bible and we have seen that constantly throughout history. Sin. This sin is so dangerous that it goes deep into our soul that we have no power on our own over it. This sin is everywhere. All have sinned. There is no one righteous, not even one. It is in this powerfulness of sin that affects us from outside. And what we must realize is that this sin is born from within. See, the world is affecting us from outside, but did you know that sin is also coming out from inside? It comes from inside. Sin comes from inside out. You see, when we are changed, right, we're changed also from inside out. When we come to know the Lord, we're changed from inside out. But sin also comes from inside out. So in the end, in the end, ultimately, there is no one else to blame but yourself. Okay? Not even Satan, not even the world, but there is no one else to blame but yourself. Sin is deeply embedded in our human hearts, and Jesus taught this truth as well. I also have taught on this verse, Mark 7, 20 to 23. This is a powerful verse. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. This is Jesus, okay? For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. And they defile a person. Jesus didn't say it's from outside. It's from you. It's from me. It's from inside. So in the end, we don't have anyone else to blame but ourselves. Why do we go to hell? Me. Why do we go to hell? My fault. Why do we go to hell? Us. It's not God's fault. It's not Jesus' fault. It's not Satan's fault. It's me. Don't blame the world. In the end, it's us. But are we working with the world? Right? Are we serving the world? Are we letting the world continually tempt us and help us with the sin from within and make it grow? Jeremiah the prophet has spoken such truth himself in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Mm. Who can understand it? The sinful heart that Jeremiah and Jesus speaks of comes all the way from the original sin of Adam and Eve. We have fallen. In our fallen sinful nature, we're born with sin and we live with sin every day. With such problem, right? With such great problem we have, this issue of sin in our life, what does the world offer? It throws more oil into the fire. What happens when you throw more oil into the fire? It explodes. What happens, right? It just ignites more flame. According to verse 16, 
The world is throwing more of oil into the fire. The world can offer you the simple heart in us, the simple flesh in us, more sins. And they're offering to you in three ways, the three sins. What are they? Desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and what? Pride of life, pride of life. Let's first look at the desires of flesh. NLT translates it, a craving for physical pleasure. The cra NIV, the cravings of a sinful man. The word flesh definitely has connection with our sexual sin, if you were thinking of that. But we can also understand this word as our bodily desires. Desires of the flesh, desires of our body. Simply, bodily craving, right? Basically, all these desires that we have to feed our physical body and everything that follows suit to make our sinful body please itself, okay? Please itself. This is all of us, right? Martin Luther said it best. The lust of the flesh is that pleasure with which I desire to indulge my flesh, such as adultery, fornication, gluttony, ease, and sleep. That was Martin Luther. Lust of the flesh is that pleasure which I desire to indulge my flesh, such as adultery, fornication, gluttony, ease, and sleep. This sin is at every turn, every moment, isn't it? Lord wanted Cain, Lord weren't Cain in Genesis 4-7. Sin is crouching at the door, its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Same goes for us when we're living against this world. What are you going to do about this door? What are you going to do about this door? When you go to sleep at night, do you keep all the doors open? and all the windows open and put up a sign robbers come thieves come is that what you do at night when you go to sleep or is it bolted shut or is it wide open desires of the flesh come right in and appetite my sinful flesh Satisfy my simple heart. We as Christians must do all that it takes to shut the desires of the flesh. For sinners are really tempted to feed their simple bodily cravings. Laziness, sleep, gluttony, fornication. Martin Luther put it best. Whatever satisfies my physical flesh. I want to act this way. I want to talk this way. I want to speak this way. Are you tempted? Are you tempted? Second thing that the world offers to sinners. You like the world, Sil? Second thing that the world offers to sinners. Desires of the eyes. Desires of the eyes. Those two one inch wide openings. Did you think about it? This is just one inch. Two of them. These two one inch wide openings destroy us at times. Do they not? What are they called? Eyes. They are a precious gift from God. It allows us to see God's amazing and marvelous creation. Yet we are led to sin most easily through what? Our eyes. Eyes are precious yet dangerous. If I gave you a million dollars, would you give me two of your eyes? Probably not. Eyes are so precious yet dangerous, aren't they? They let in light, but they can also let in temptation. They let in beautiful lights and visibility through your eyes that you can, you know, translate in your brain to see what you're seeing, but they also let in sin through your eyes. 
and the world, guess what? The world is doing all that it can to keep our eyeballs wide open. To keep our eyeballs wide open for those mistakes. Sin of covet. Desiring to have something through our eyes. Ungodly status. Success in life. Pursuit of ungodly things. Desiring possession and people that are not yours. Lust. Greedy look. Dress to impress. Are you trying to seduce or tempt someone? In Genesis chapter 3, Eve saw that the tree was good, a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. What did she do? She took of its fruit, ate, and sinned. What did she use? The light of the eyes. How about Lot's wife? If you are a biblical scholar, if you read the Old Testament, she looked back when she was told not to, and she became a pillar of salt. Just like that. What did she use? The light of the eyes. How about our faithful King David? Even our faithful king. Do you think you're faithful as King David? He saw Bathsheba baiting, committed adultery, murder her husband, and pay for his sin for the rest of his life. What did he use? The light of the eyes. How passionate is Jesus on this teaching against such temptations from the world? This is not me, guys. This is Jesus in regards to the delight of the eyes. He passionately preaches on a radically exaggerated message for a man to gouge out his eye. Right? Jesus preaches. Take out your eye. Why? Why? So you don't go to hell. Jesus says, I would rather take out my eye than me going to hell and my whole body to suffer forever in hell. Jesus is saying, just cut your arm, take out your eye. Right? Jesus is not teaching self-mutilation. He's teaching a radically exaggerated message to such a harshest degree to making a radical point so that you will understand that the eyes are killing you so you don't go to hell look around you today maybe I should say don't look around you today my children and I we drive in Los Angeles every day and it's hard to drive around Los Angeles today. Every time we have to bounce our eyes, every time we have to close our eyes, every time we have to, you know, pray. Everywhere is surrounded by bad pictures. That's what we call them in our clock family, bad pictures, bad pictures. Bad pictures. Sometimes I hear my kids, like, because I didn't see it, right? And then Joey's like, bad pictures! And then my sons are like, don't look at it! How do you know it's a bad picture? You look at it! Ah! And then when, like, in the car, everybody's screaming and getting, like, yelling and tattletelling, da 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 right? It's like, bad pictures! That's what we call them in our home. But what are you doing? We're doing something about it. Do you just keep it quiet? And you look at it and you go, hmm. And you don't tell anyone. And then the other person looks at it. Hmm. I think it's good that we point out the problem together. So every time we pass by such places, we now know where bad pictures are. So everybody's like, okay, close your eyes. And then they go, dad, can we open our eyes? Can we open our eyes? I'm like, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> We look to God every time we close our eyes. We look to God in our hearts. That's where our true delight should be. Don't follow the first Adam and Eve. Don't follow the first Adam and Eve who fell with their eyes. But follow the last Adam whose eyes were fixated to God in all of his life on earth. For in God, we see the path to life. 
In him there is fullness of joy. There is true delight and pleasure to our eye and our soul. Psalmist sings this truth in Psalm 1611. Can we read this together? Ready? Begin. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen? Look to God. Fix your eyes upon God. Close your eyes. Open your heart to God. The last offering. You still like the world? The last offering from the world into our hearts is pride of life. Pride of life. The climax of unholy trinity. Of temptations. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a British minister, called it the most serious and terrible of the three. The pride of life. Simply put, arrogance, boasting, probably the root cause of all other sins in life, including the first two that we study today, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes. Basically how this temptation comes is you put yourself above everyone else. It's focusing on the gifts rather than the giver. It's glorifying the creation, what you see around you, rather than the creator in the flesh. We act like animals. We do what our body desires, right? That's why stealing is okay now. Oh, he just needed more money, so let him steal. It's okay. Oh, your body desires homosexual thoughts and sins? It's okay, that's what the body wants. So continue to live that way. Oh, you have lazy issues? Oh, that's not a sin. That's just how our body is made. Live that way. In the flesh, we act like animals as if it's okay. We do what our body desires. In the eyes, we hope to have more than others. In the pride of life, we start to put ourselves above God. We start to put ourselves to be a little God. Remember Satan? Remember Noah's Ark? Remember Tower of Babel? We find things to pride ourselves in, in this own little, own little life that we have made, right? In this own little life that we have made, we find so much joy and we find so much peace here, rather than the life that Christ has purchased for us on that old rugged cross. The unholy trinity of temptation is not a new thing that John is pointing out for his readers. Satan has been using it since the time of creation. It was the reason that he fell. Pride got to him, right? He wanted to be like God. That's why he fell. And he came down to earth. He tempted Adam and Eve with desires of the flesh, food, fruit from the tree. Don't you want to eat it? Desires of the eyes, her desire to have something attractive. Isn't this fruit nice to eat? Don't you want this? Look at it. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's not going to hurt you. Pride of life. Her desire to have wisdom and knowledge. Don't you want to be like God? You'll be like God. So they fell. They enter Satan, the prince of this world. They entered into his devious scheme. So in New Testament, Satan comes again to the last Adam with saying temptation, desires of the flesh. Remember Jesus when he was fasting? 40 days, 40 nights, food, his hunger for bread, desires of the eyes, his appreciation of the world's beauty and brilliance. I'll give you all of this. Look at this world. And pride of life. Satan asked him to jump. Him jumping would show God's extra protection and care over him, focusing on the gifts rather than the giver, on the creation rather than the creator. However, Jesus, the Son of God, does not fall as he fights these temptations with the Word of God from Old Testament. So is it, so is it any surprise to you that we're attacked this way in the world? Desires of the flesh, food, comfort, entertainment, sex, desires of the eyes, desire to have something attractive, lust, covet, jealousy, pride of life, we're the master of our own destiny. We're the Lord of our own life. We are all little gods. We don't have anyone else to answer to. When we die, we're not gonna go see God. This is my life. 
Just as Christ was victorious over such temptations, you and I can be victorious as well. We too have the ability to overcome. We too have the Word of God, Old Testament and New Testament, to fight against such temptation in the world. Last reason to not love this world? Know where this world is going. Know where this world is going. Look at verse 17. Let's read it together. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Would you like to invest your money in things that are going up in value or going down? It's an obvious question, isn't it? But it's an important one. Of course you want to invest your money in things that are going up. If it were up to me, I would like to invest in things that are eternal. Things that are not passing away. Guess what? We can and we know exactly how to do that. Because this world, all that they can offer is things that are passing away. Everything and everyone in this world, living for this world, is simply a walking dead. The living dead has only one destination. It's eternal death and hell. This world, this ideology of Satan's evil system, is already passing away. It's in the process of self-destruction. The satanic world system and all the people who are chasing after worldly desires are sprinting towards their eternal damnation. That's the only goal in sight. They don't know it now, but it will be clear to them when they die physically. You know what's scarier for men and women? It's not the first death, but it's the second death. Because first death is physical. When your body dies, it's over, that's it. But second death is eternal, your soul. It continues, and that's eternal. Most important question for everyone living on this earth today is, where will you spend your eternity? Because our life on earth is so short. You don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. Who knows that? Nobody knows that. You're not guaranteed a single day in life. Let's say that you even live up to be 100 years old. You lived a long life, okay? I don't know if I want to live to be 100. Well, let's say that you do. 100 compared to eternity is not even comparable. It's like not even a dot in the whole Milky Way galaxy, not even a tiny star. So first death is not that important if you really think about it. Second death is really important because second death is eternal. Where will you spend your eternity? Suffering forever in hell or delighting forever in heaven? One who does the will of God abides forever. So who do you love? Who do you love? World or God? Where are you putting your energy, time and resources? World or God? Things in the world are passing away. Invest in things that are forever and eternal. Heaven, things of God, saving souls, sharing the gospel, raising godly children. Don't you want to see your children in heaven? Discipling men and women for God's kingdom. Don't you want to see your church members in heaven? Don't you want to see your family in heaven? Invest in them. Buy them a gift. Buy them a food. Invite them over to your house. Invest in things that are forever and eternal. Missionary and martyr, Jim Elliot once said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Are you so tempted by the world that you cannot live for God? Luther also says, What sort of God is it that is not even capable of defending himself against moth and rust? The world is absolutely passing away. Are you loving the right and righteous God? Or are you loving the evil and unrighteous world? Who are you living for? Are you doing God's will? Or are you doing the world's will? I am reminded of an old hymn as I close this message and as we go into time of prayer. Could you close your eyes? 
Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look who in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. One more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's pray together, church. Let's think about today's message and let's see what God wants to challenge you with. What are the temptations? What are the things of the world that you really like and that you've been enjoying? If you're a Christian, you cannot live habitually in this world. You must hate it. Yes, we will fall because we're in the sinful flesh. Yes, we will fall. We have the sinful heart. But you got to understand, God has given us a new heart, a new soul for us to live with. Church, these sins, it's coming from within and we're being affected by the world. Are you going to live in this world or are you going to do all that you can to bolt the door, shut the door so no temptations can come into your house, can come into your heart, can come into your mind? Let's pray right now. Let's ask the Lord to bless us to walk this way, to walk this life for Him. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to live for you and to walk with you. Father, what a blessing it is that, that we can fix our eyes upon you, Jesus. That it's not about me. That we do not look at the things of this world anymore. Desires of the eyes, desires of the flesh, and the pride of life are the only things that the world is offering to us. The sin. That's the only thing, God. But God, in this life, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to look to your wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim, God. And I'm not going to be tempted anymore. On that day, when I see you face to face, where there is no sin, no weeping, no crying, no anger, no jealousy, no covetousness, no lust. Oh, that wonderful and glorious day I wait to see you face to face. Till that day, let all these temptations of the world go strangely to me. In your light, we walk. In your light, we live. In your light, we breathe. And we see your glory. We see your grace. So God, Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your message. What is to not love? What is to not love? And that is this world. The satanic evil system. Unbiblical, worldly values that are tempting us, that are trying to captivate our thoughts, our mind, our words, our feelings, our souls in so many ways. God, we have heard your message today, this afternoon. Let our life change. Let us walk in the light. Let us see your glory and grace. And let these things of the world go strangely dim. Because our eyes are fixated on you, not on this world. We know where this world is going. And we know where we're going. And we're going in opposite direction. Help me to realize today. Help me to recognize today. Help me to proclaim this truth in my life. Now we're in this world, but we're not of this world, and we are of heaven. We're your citizens, and we belong. And we're going to the right place, to the right owner, to the right just God that we worship. So Lord, thank you for teaching us your trip today. 
And we pray that everyone in here knows this truth and believes in this truth and walks this truth. And if there's anyone listening to this message that have not made the decision to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be a believer of this truth, would you work in their heart, would you transform their heart and help them to know that this is simply a gift, a gift of eternal life, of knowing you here on earth and in heaven forever and ever. We thank you. We thank you for saving us and calling us as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.